Hello Watch Enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler. For a mountain climber, with the possible exception of K2, Everest is the Holy Grail. In 2019, however, over 800 people summited this 8,848 metre mountain, which seems rather a lot for the highest peak in existence. Of course, the climb remains treacherous, with over 300 having lost their lives on the way to reaching the peak, many of whom remain entombed on the path of others. Long before the commercialisation of Everest, though, it was a very different place. Originally known simply as Peak 15, Everest was named by the Royal Geographic Society after the former Surveyor General of India, Sir George Everest, in 1865, a year before his death. At 8,848 metres, this is the tallest mountain from sea level and presents a uniquely challenging environment for a climber. In fact, by the top of the mountain, no flora or fauna are found, aside from flying birds, due to the rarefied air and extremely cold temperatures. Aside from the obvious threat of falling, frostbite, hypothermia, embolisms, thrombosis, exhaustion, or even acute sunburn seriously threaten a climber. If a watch is going to survive this as an explorer's companion, it really does need to be tough. Now, a lot of watches have survived the climb up Mount Everest, but the most famous were those worn during the very first climb, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay's ascent, in 1953. Together, this pair made their way up the mountain and reached the top on the 29th of May 1953. For rather a while, many assumed the watch on Hillary's wrist, at least, was an early Rolex Explorer. With its iconic looks, its high contrast black dial and Mercedes hands, the idea is pretty understandable. In truth, though, the story seems much, much more interesting. At this point, I would like to say that all information in this video is based on evidence from reputable sources, the best of which is cited below. If anything is based on conjecture, I will make it clear. First, we should address Smith's. Founded in 1851, Smith's was an English watch brand which is perhaps best known for the work of other divisions of the company, notably those specialising in the making of rev counters for racing cars and aeronautical equipment. However, they did produce some rather interesting watches during their tenure, including some military pieces in the 1960s and 1970s. Until the 1940s, Robert Lenoir from Gigi Le Coutre was employed as technical director and presented a number of Swiss mechanical solutions following Smith's use of Longines movements at the very beginning of their production of wristwatches. But how does this relate to our subject today? Well, crucially, Edmund Hillary made this statement about a Smith's watch after his ascent to the top of Everest. I carried your watch to the summit, it worked perfectly. Now this statement is a difficult one to decipher. Does it mean that Hillary wore the watch on the summit of Everest? Well, the 1953 British expedition was officially supplied by Smith's, and it's believed that 13 or so watches were used. Equally, from 1953, Smith's produced a product line clearly entitled Everest. With that being said, the watch worn on Everest wasn't actually an Everest, but a Smith's Deluxe A409 with luminous numerals, syringe hands, and small seconds at 6 o'clock, courtesy of a 15 dual movement. The Everest added to the dial from 1953 was instead a commemorative touch. The example which is known to have been worn by Hillary currently resides in the Clockmakers Company Museum. If you're enjoying this video, please remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to catch our latest videos. Also, follow us on Instagram to know about the most interesting watches out there, and head over to watchchronicle.com to read extensive articles about the most interesting, historic, and important watches you deserve to know about. But now we come to the more complex question regarding Rolex. As is often stated, Rolex was as keen in the 1950s as it is today to be involved with expeditions and endeavours to prove its watches. The expeditions to the summit of Mount Everest were clearly no exception. To understand how Rolex found its way to the top of Everest, we actually have to look to 1952, a year before the famous ascent. Before even setting foot on Everest, such an expedition was very complicated to plan. Following China's annexation of Tibet in 1950, foreigners were unable to enter the country, and crucially, it remained unclear whether Everest could be climbed from its Nepalese side. This, luckily, was demonstrated in 1951 by Eric Shipton's climb to Kumbu Icefall. Even so, only one expedition was permitted by Nepal each year, and in 1952, it was Switzerland which was given permission. Led by physician and alpinist Edouard weiss dunant this expedition took Tenzing Norgay and Raymond Lambert within 400 metres of the summit. This expedition, as you can imagine, was a serious credit to Switzerland, and so Rolex provided commemorative watches to the expedition's participants, including a gold Rolex Datejust with a stunning fluted bezel for Norgay. Let's not forget that, released in 1945, 
this was a cutting-edge product. It's unclear whether Norgay wore a Rolex for the climb. Come 1953, Britain was preparing its own expedition to Everest under the leadership of Colonel John Hunt. It's believed that in order to join the expedition, Norgay had to be convinced, presumably due to the inherent danger present. For this, John Hunt approached Raymond Lambert, who not only convinced Norgay to go on the expedition, but also, as a Swiss man and advocate of his country, to wear his Rolex rather than the English Smiths. Consequently, it is possible that it was a gold Rolex datejust which summited Everest. It is alternatively possible that, once Rolex issued watches officially to the expedition, Norgay decided to leave the gold date just behind in exchange for a steel model. On Hillary's side, and with Rolex issuing watches to the expedition, the choice of watch seems much clearer. Even so, for some time it was believed by many that it was an early Rolex Explorer which was worn. More recently, it's become clear that the watch was in fact an Oyster Perpetual with luminous hands, a luminous dial, and a blued second hand. Whilst this could have been a Rolex reference 6580, the version used for Everest was a prototype, with a luminous triangle replacing the coronet at 12 o'clock on the 6580. Aside from the different dial, there were a couple of other distinctions of note about this watch. Firstly, it was mounted to a much longer leather strap in order to fit around the outside of clothing, and the lubricants used were adapted to much colder temperatures. The watch worn to the peak of Everest by Hillary is most likely the Rolex on a long leather strap now residing in the Bayer Watch Museum in Zurich. Whilst in Hodinkee's Talking Watches, René Bayer stated uncertainty as to which of the pair wore this watch, although it does appear to me that it was probably Hillary's, as Rolex themselves took back Norgay's issued watch in exchange for a replacement later in 1953. With that being said, we may never know exactly which watch corresponded to which climber. Even so, I do still have some uncertainty regarding another appearance of this prototype watch in Rolex's own archives. Here is kept an identical example from 1953, bar the red text on the dial of Bayer's version. It's even presented by Rolex amongst the members of the Explorer collection, beside photographs of Norgay and Hillary, and on the same extended leather strap. Perhaps this example was worn by another member of the expedition. What we do know, though, is that all these prototypes were returned after the expedition, and that Hillary received a Rolex reference 6580 from Bossex Rolex in Calcutta. Almost identical to the prototype which summited Everest on the 29th of May, this example is heavily water damaged and now features in the Auckland War Memorial Museum. Today, almost 10,000 successful climbs to the summit of Everest have taken place, and it's perhaps easy to underestimate the brutality of this environment on a watch. Even so, these watches, whether made in Switzerland or in Cheltenham, managed to survive in a time when it wasn't even known whether such a peak could be reached. Which was your favourite? If you enjoyed this video, please like, share and subscribe, it really helps. Thank you very much for watching, this is Armon from watchchronicle.com, out.